This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Let's get on to this and make it quick and short. I'm not sure I do quick and short, but I'll do my best. Oh, that'll, you know what? That does <laughs> drone on as long All as right. you want. So I am just waiting for the first question like a horse stamping at the <laughs> beginning of the, of, the, of the race line. All right. So this is uh, Stephen Frug. And I can do the Frug. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. So Thank you. as we do, we will ask the five questions. What's your first encounter with a wolf story? So my first encounter actually was with Wolf himself. I went back in 1987 to ReaderCon 1, the very first ReaderCon, which is an annual, almost annual science fiction convention still going on. They're up to you know 30 or whatever it is by now, 30-something. Um, Gene Wolfe was the guest of honor. It was only my second science fiction convention. I had gone to Boscone, the big Boston area convention, uh, but the science fantasy bookstore in you know the Boston area had a flyer for ReaderCon, and I had enjoyed Boscone, and so I thought, hey, I'll go to this. Um, and in fact, I volunteered to be a, you know, whatever they're called, henchman. Volunteer. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I got there, like the, the, it was mostly a two-day con, Saturday and Sunday, but on Friday they were having something for the volunteers. So I actually got there before anyone else was there. I was like waiting in the hotel lobby thinking, am I in the right place? Um, but then that night... You know, there was the con suite and the volunteers were, the gophers were all there. Um, and there was Gene Wolf, who I knew nothing about. So the very first Wolf prose I was introduced to was his guest of honor speech. Oh, great. Uh, at ReaderCon 1, which is actually reprinted in Castle of Days. It's nestled in a column or something where he has like the introductory material and the closing material talking about the hotel. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the column, I think it's called From House on the Borderland, is the text that he read. And I just loved it. It was amazing. Right. It was It was just, it, it's one of those things that's still like just is with me today. Like the sentiments in that, where he talks about the new illiteracy of not reading. It's, it's if you've not reread it recently, uh, it's, it's a fabulous essay. At the con, I think I got this idea from Isaac Asimov that this is what you did. So I went and bought a copy in the dealer's room of Fifth Head of Cerberus, and I got him to sign it. Oh, that's a great start, isn't it? But that wasn't actually the first one I read. Oh. The first one I read, and I don't remember why. I think I bought a second one. I bought The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories. So the first one I actually read was The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories, which is, I think, a perfect starting place. I'm really glad I started there. It's just, you know, such a fabulous story and it's a lot less forbidding in some way mm -hmm. for your first wolf story than fifth head of story wow that's yeah that's really great that may be more than you wanted to know no 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 that's a, no no that's terrific terrific i just didn't i didn't know that you were done <laughs> yeah so i mean you know i went to this con and everyone was talking about how he was the greatest thing since sliced bread i remember <laughs> michael swanwick saying at one point at ReaderCon one uh I, except for Gene Wolfe, I'm the best writer in this room. Possibly true. Probably true. <laughs> um, although I don't think everyone knew it yet. <laughs> I met Joe May. Uh, what was his name? Joe Mayhew, I think, was the Dedic Key of Nightside the Long Sun. He was at ReaderCon 1. And he said on a panel on Wolfe's work that it's a variation of the old Arthur C. Clarke line that at a sufficiently advanced uh, technology is indistinguishable from metaphor was the spirit of Wolf's work, which uh, everyone thought was like, sort of puzzling and funny. And, uh, you know, it was, it was wonderful. Were a lot of people there just to see Wolf? It was not. I mean, it was the first one. There were only a couple hundred of us. It was pretty small. I don't think so. I think it was, you know, I mean, there might've been, it was hard to know, you know, it was just all of these sort of people who were really into literate SF, which is sort of what I'd been searching for all my life up until that point. And I, finally found it. I also was introduced to the work of Philip K. Dick at this convention in a marathon discussion session on the last day with Eric Van, the programming chair who has since become a good friend and is a wolf reader. And he always said his three favorite writers were Wolf, Crowley, and Philip K. Dick. Well, they are all of a certain set. 
you know, okay, Wolf kind of belongs in the middle there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would say Dick, who I really like, is not quite up for me at the level of the other two, but I think Wolf and Crowley have remained mm-hmm. favorites of mine ever since. So what is your favorite novel or short story? Either or both. So I would say novel is in some ways easier because it's the book of the new sun. I think, you know, it's just such an amazing work. I've read it. God, I don't even know at this point, four or five times. I actually have read volume one more because I read it several times, you know, intending to read the whole thing and didn't get through right. it. For one yeah. reason or the other. <laughs> so I've read like the first half of, of Shadow of the Torturer, maybe 10 times, the whole first book, like seven times, and then the whole book, like four or five times. So I actually ironically know the first bit much better, but it's so wonderful. For short story is harder because there's so many wonderful ones, but I think I would say in general, his novellas of the 1970s. So I would say for there, either Seven American Nights or For Lesson, one of those two. Novella is the perfect length for Wolf. I don't know why he is so ideal at that. I will say it's it's interesting when you say novella is the perfect length. I think that's right. And I always remember the Book of the New Sun started as a novella. And I think that's not an accident that like he was in his novella mode and he kept it going for four books. Yeah, that, yeah, he just he just kept doing novellas. That kind of makes sense. What's your favorite wolf word? All right, so I was thinking about this, and I narrowed it down to three, um, each favorites in a slightly different way. So there's fuligen, mm-hmm. which I like, but I think what I like is not it as a as a word in and of itself, but the idea he plays with it, right? So the idea of the color that's darker than black is such a powerful SF idea. Right. So I love that. I mean, he pulled an old word for for sooty black Mm -hmm. for it, but I think there what I like is his use of it. And I've seen people use it in in prose since then, clearly having read Wolf. (laughs) It's nice. In terms of more purely verbal, I think what I like best is watch. The way he talks about, you know, shorter is the watch than ends the night. Instead of an hour, a watch. Exactly. It's such a lovely use, and it's so both natural and unfamiliar. And I have always loved that he he brought it back in the epigraph to volume one to sort of prepare you for that shortest the watch that ends the night before the rising sun, mm-hmm. and you know so many watches. So that's a wonderful word. And then the last one I'd mention is pen creator. And I don't even know. I assume he didn't invent that. You know, I I don't think I've ever encountered it outside of wool but it's just such a lovely term for God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how about a personal non-consensus theory about a wolf story or just your favorite one? So I would say my favorite one, which I don't actually believe, but I want to believe, if you know what I mean? Like I wish it were true. I get that. Is the reading of Fifth Head of Cerberus that your the other great Gene Wolfe podcast, the Gene Wolfe Literary <laughs> podcast, um, who are very different than you guys, but is, is equally good. And so everyone should listen to both. Mm-hmm. Did a very long, you know, more than a year on Fifth Head of Cerberus. And then in their final two or three episodes, before they had Mark Aramini on to blow the whole thing out of the water, um, in their final two or three episodes, they developed a theory that there were never any aliens on the two planets that they were a myth yeah, yeah. invented to sort of explain the trauma of the colonial wars and the, the, the you know, the kind of, it's a, an old, a myth to sort of justify and explain away the horrors of, that they inflicted on each other. And it's just such a great reading. I don't think it's what he meant based, among other things, on interviews where he talked about it. But I sort of think someone should write that book where there are aliens and it turns out there aren't. And they make such a subtle reading for it. Right. Partly, I think, because it's not actually what the text (laughs) says, so you have to be subtle about it. But it really, you know, the idea that you're reading this book and reading this book and then you think, oh, my God, there never were (laughs) is is just brilliant. So that's my favorite reading. It's I don't think it's what the text meant, but I love that the text can almost support it. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's the way it is with Fifth Head of Cerberus, right? There's, there are several things that the text can almost support. So, most frustrating mystery in a wolf story. So, I, I'm not the type, I think, to take mysteries and, and work them for that long. But the one that 
I have returned to the most is actually sort of in a story called How the Whip Came Back. I don't know if you remember that one. Mm -hmm. It's in Gene Wolfe's Book of Days. I believe it's the story for, for Lincoln's birthday. And there's just this incredible balance in that story between irony and sincerity. And the woman is playing the Pope who she meets with over the course of the story. And whether exactly who she's lying to and exactly what she plans to do in the vote the next day is very hard to interpret. And you can go back and forth. I've had friends of mine who I've like handed the story to and said, please read this so you can tell me. <laughs> say that they think it doesn't matter that in some sense, you know, the, the, the point of the story is, is holds either way. And I think there's a lot to that, but you know, I, I, I really feel like I want to hear a, really knock on explanation. Of I haven't read how the whip came back in a long time. I'll have to check that out and think about that one. It's a great story. And actually, I don't know if you're following the Gene Wolf Literary Podcast, but the first one I ever listened to was that one because I thought, oh my God, they covered it. I need to go go listen to it. And it's it was sort of a good entry point because they're doing you know a lot of the short stories from the 60s and 70s. Right, exactly. We had a conversation about that and Glenn McDorman of the Gene Wolf Literary Podcast said, yeah, I'm pretty sure that our podcast and y'all's, the Venn diagram is about 100%. So <laughs> I'd say they're marvelously just different in approach. Yeah. And I love that there are both of them because Wolf is so good and can clearly support it. Right. And all four of you guys are really deeply into his work in very different ways. So yeah, no, it's, it's great. Uh, well. All right. Well, thank you, Stephen. This is really great. I need to get back to uh, writing the comments now for your your latest uh, input. So really appreciate that. <laughs> I am still uh, writing the comments for the next one. <laughs> well, one of the great things about your podcast is the push and pull between you and Craig, where you're kind of saying, oh, and then maybe this means there's a whole conspiracy for everything. And he'll be like, well, well, yeah, but it could just be him being emo. Like, I think the, the dialectic there really produces some great conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's totally serendipitous. So while I have you here, maybe I can spend 30 seconds more gushing over the show. Because... <laughs> oh, no, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have really just enjoyed. I mean, we're coming up to the point in the book where I'm going to have to start reading every chapter as you discuss it. Mm -hmm. First few chapters, uh, you know, I had read so often. I really knew backwards and forwards, but nevertheless, I mean, just there's so much in there and it's so wonderful to go bit by bit. And I love how you guys take your time. And like, I mean, the fact that each episode is two hours is the glory of the show, as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, we were so scared about that. <laughs> like episode three is kind of a mess with Craig trying to edit it down to an hour. Yeah, but it means like you're really not cutting anything short or you're not doing the Well, we don't have time to go into details. You're going into all the details and i love it we will <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the intros are so funny oh great um in fact i have to go back like the first three or four times you said okay sponsored by and i would like fast forward so i got to the real show <laughs> it was only like one time when i like forgot to do that and i realized wait a minute these are all jokes <laughs> and they're all so funny i still have to go back and listen to the first three or four of them because i missed them well i'll tell you the background on that is that i was listening to mike duncan's History of Rome or one of his revelations. Oh, I love those. And so all of them are very much inspired by the way he delivers those. And and I, so I was just thinking, wow, wouldn't it be great if we had sponsors? Who would sponsor us? <laughs> That's probably why I got into the habit of, of skipping them. Because with the History of Rome and, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't admit it in public, but, you know, I always... <laughs> well, how many Harry's razors can you buy, really? Yeah, exactly. Hit that fast forward until you hear the music right. and then go. So the general public, I tend to say his is on my favorite podcast because obviously the wolf ones are, if you're a wolf fan, are like the best, but, you know, most, a lot of people aren't. Right. And so just anyone can pick up his and listen. And I think right. they're That's true. all superb. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. This is really great. This was fun. Thank you for doing yeah. it. And uh, I look forward to hearing the others. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Bye-bye. This was, again, entirely sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. 
And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out to us by email or one of the other methods listed in the show notes of this episode.